Good evening, everyone. Tonight we're going to um, get started with our um, our study in Isaiah chapter fifty-two. Uh, to be right honest with you, I'm I'm enjoying Isaiah. Uh, it just seems like it's interesting to be able to read where the nation of Israel was at the time that that Isaiah is giving these. Uh, prophecies and and where we're seeing God go and and with this what we see in chapter 52 is that there is a change where uh, again God is giving Isaiah the words uh, of the coming of Christ he is uh, he's letting them know that there will be a a salvation that is coming shortly and with that, he is uh, letting them know that that God is the one that is going to um, God's going to be the one that delivers them. And with that, uh, we'll look at these verses. Uh, we've sort of got it divided, I think, into four different sections. Uh, verses one and two will be the first section, and it says, "Awake, awake! Put on your strength, O Zion." Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Now, when we left off in chapter 51, if we remember, uh, the nation of Israel had looked at God and, and basically said, you need to wake up. It's time for you to, to quit slumber, to quit sleeping, and it's time for you to look back at the nation of Israel and what it is that you have have uh, uh, have chosen for us to be and to do, and, and it's time to uphold your end of the bargain. And, and basically what we find God coming back and saying is, I'm not the one that's asleep. And, and here in the first two verses of chapter 2, again, or 52, what we find is God saying those same things. Israel, it's time that you wake up. So we see this theme as it as it carries through in chapter fifty-two, and he again tells Zion or or Jerusalem that it's time for them to wake up from their spiritual sleep. He tells them that once they awake up, that they are to put on their strength and they're to put on their beautiful garments. And basically what I look at this as being is it's time for Jerusalem to finally shake the sleep from their eyes to get ready to go to work for what God has called them to do and to be prepared for the time when he's going to allow them to come out of bondage. Christ or God is basically saying through Isaiah here that you all have been asleep and that it's time that you wake up and that you get ready to get your day started. Now, we all know at times when when uh, our kids were smaller and and you would have work that needed to be done that that sometimes you would have to wake up early and and you would go in and you would wake them up and it, it's like they were still in a little bit of a of a daze and a fog and this is where we find Israel right now they're sort of still in that sleep fog they they realize that they've been put into captivity they understand that God has said that they would be delivered but they're still in, in that little bit of a fog. But what we find God doing here is he is preparing them for this next phase, this new phase that would come into Israel's life. And, and he's preparing them to be the witness that he had called them to be throughout the world. He's preparing them to fulfill what their chosen calling was. And as I read these words and as I, I looked at what God is, is saying to the nation of Israel, I think today that we as a church can also find some, some good uh, uh, guidance in these words that God has said. And, and that is this, it is time for us to wake up. For too long, the churches in America have been in that sleepful slumber. I, I think they've been awake, but they've still not rubbed the sleep from their eyes. And part of it comes into, I feel that, that we have been 
uh, a very blessed nation. And because God has blessed us, that we've not put the effort into uh, serving him the way that he has called us to be, because really and truly salvation has been too easy for us. But when we find ourselves in tough spots, when we look at the things that may not make sense to us, and and we try to put things together uh, and make sense out of it in the human standpoint, I think there's times that God looks at us and says, it's time to wake up, church, and, and it's time that you fulfill the calling for the New Testament church, and that is to go, to teach, to preach, to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, and it's to start in our churches, in our communities, in our county, in our state, in our nation, and throughout the whole world. Now, when Christ gave that great commission, he said, go you into all the world. Well, all of the world is our back door also. And I think sometimes we we overlook that. Uh, but we have a mission that God has called us to be. And, and if we notice, there are action words that God places in this scripture. And these action words tell us what God intends the nation of Israel to do. He says, you are to wake up. You are to put on both your strength and the garments. You are to shake yourselves. That means that once you get up, sometimes we have to wipe the sleep from our eyes. We have to stretch and we have to, to get moving. But he also says that we're to shake the dust from us. So that we, the nation of Israel had been sitting in bondage for so long. They had been uh, waiting on God to do something that, that dust had been able to accumulate on them. And he's saying, you need to get up. You need to shake the dust from you. You need to arise, which means you need to get up and you need to be prepared. Uh, no longer am I allowing you to lay in your bed, even if you're awake. It's time to get up and to do something. He says that they are to be seated and they are to loose their bonds. What we find God telling them is that for too long, Israel had been sitting on their blessed assurance and they were continuing to hit the snooze button on God's spiritual alarm clock. And for the time being, God is saying that that I'm removing that alarm clock. It's, it's no longer an option for you to hit that snooze button. There is work to be done, and I am calling you to action once I deliver you out of the bondage of, of Israel or out of uh, Babylon. See, God doesn't deliver us from the infirmities in our lives just so we can continue to be lazy, too. He doesn't want us to go back to sleep once he brings us from a place uh, uh, where we've needed his uh, assistance, where we've needed his his guidance, where we've needed his comfort. He calls us to action just as he did the nation of Israel here. If we look in verses uh, 3 through 6, we find the next part, and it says, For Thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Jerusalem to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? The rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. So God is reminding the nation of Israel that he is the one that allowed them to be taken into captivity. He says they were sold for nothing, and then they would be redeemed for nothing. God would place them back in their rightful place once their 70 years' time of captivity was us. And they know that throughout history that God has faithfully delivered them from their captors, even starting back in Egypt when when we find Joseph and, and the way that the nation of Israel was spared with the the, the um, uh, food that had been prepared during the time of the drought, 
Uh, he, he was able to give the nation stability during that time. And we know throughout Scripture that it says that there was a change in kings who didn't know about Joseph and the things that had been done. And because of that, he looked at the Jews and he said they're becoming way too powerful. They have the potential to overthrow us, so we're going to put them into slavery, into bondage. Well, God allowed them to be delivered from that bondage. He allowed them to be delivered from the Assyrians once they had set their attack uh, on them also. And, and God is just saying that throughout history, I have been faithful to deliver you from your captives, and I'm going to do it again. I, I don't worry about it. I will deliver you from Babylon. And while the people were upset with God, while they were grumbling, while they were uh, wondering why it was that they had been allowed to be taken in to captivity, while the people, uh, again, were the ones that had disobeyed God, uh, they are the ones that disobeyed and allowed themselves to be taken captive. Now, we have to understand this is a punishment for their disobedience to God. It says that, you know, his name was even ill spoken of. Well, they were looking at it and saying, God, why have you not delivered us? But he is saying in the end, I will deliver you in a way that you are not going to be able to mistake that it was the hand of God that removed you from Babylon. Therefore, my people shall know my name and they shall know that it is I that speak. God just basically said, when I move, there will be such a, a, an awesome movement that takes place that you'll have no other way to turn but up and know that I am the one that has delivered you. Now, again, as we look at this, this is not something that God allowed just for his own entertainment. They are in captivity because the nation of Israel willfully disobeyed God. They were not listening to his voice. And because they had turned their back against God, he had allowed the Babylonians to come in and to take them captive. Now, while God had allowed them to be taken captive, he is now going to allow them to be delivered from that bondage. And when they are delivered, they're going to know exactly, very loudly, and very clearly that it is God that did this. When we look at verses 7 through 10, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice together. They sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord of Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Well, here we find that, that Christ is speaking of the deliverance that's going to take place. He's going to take these people who were in this state of despair, who were in this state of dejection, these chosen people, the ones that, that he had set apart for something different, the ones that he had allowed to be taken into captivity, and he is going to deliver them to the place where he expects them to be, and that is in the holy city. Not only are they going to know who delivers them, but all of this wailing and this despising of God's name is going to be turned into praise and into rejoicing. I find this to be interesting. A lot of times when we get our place in a in our, ourselves in a bind, find ourselves in a place where where we may be uncomfortable and and we turn to God and he doesn't immediately answer the prayers, then we want to 
to sort of down God? Why is it that God's not answered this prayer? Why is it that God's not delivered me from this? Why is it that God has not allowed this to, to move past me? And, and it seems like when God finally does move and when we look back and we see that God's hand is the one that has delivered us, when we see that, that God is the one that has answered that prayer, then we want to, to turn around and start to praise him and to rejoice him. The, the, the nation of Israel here is doing nothing more than what we as, as humans do naturally, and that is complain about the things that we can't control and then praise him once he pulls through for us again. But just like the nation of Israel, then we forget. We forget what God has delivered us from, and we forget that he is the one that watched us through everything that's ever been an issue. But for this time being, for the time of deliverance that, that Isaiah is speaking of here, they're going to turn their voices to the praise and to the rejoicing of Christ. And, and notice that this is a, a major change. It's, it's a 180 turn. The, the change in their attitudes and the, the change in their actions and the demeanor that they were expressing when they're told about this good news of deliverance by God. They, they change completely. They go from being dejected and they go from blaming it all on God to becoming happy and praising God for what he is going to do. They are, are praising the one that is bringing the good news to them. He tells also that they're going to find peace, that they're going to find happiness, that they're going to find salvation as a result of, of learning of these things. They lift up their voices in a song of joy. Well, why is it that they do that? Why do they all of a sudden change everything that they have been doing and, and turn back to God and, and start to praise him with everything that they're worth? Well, I think that the last part of, of verse 8 is what brings this to light. For eye to eye, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. They have finally woke up. They have finally shook off the sleep. They have finally rubbed the sleep out of their eyes. And once they have come out of this spiritual sleep, they recognize by the power that they were given a, a comfort. They recognize this, this peace that comes upon them as something that could only come from the one who had redeemed them. And I think that this word, redeem, it's one of the most interesting words, and it's an awesome word for us to understand. And when we look at this word, it can be defined as to be purchased back to be rescued from captivity or bondage, to be repurchased or to regain possession of these people so that they could be saved. Now, redemption is such a, a, a word that is meaningful to each and every one of us as, as one of God's believers. It, it, when we look at redemption, it is our personal story if we have been saved. We have been purchased back. We have been rescued from the bonds of sin, and God regains possession of what was rightfully his as his creation to begin with, and that we are called out. We are called back to him through the sinful state that we were in, and we are saved when we ask God for forgiveness. This word redemption, the redeemed Jerusalem. To, to me, I, I just see that as being a foretelling of, of what Christ would do and the way that we in the sinful state that we find ourselves in as human beings would be bought back, would be rejoined back into the, 
the relationship and into uh, the family of God in a way that he had in it, intended for it to be when we finally realize that we're a sinner and when we ask God to forgive us. You see, that's where the nation of Israel was. They had finally gotten to a point that, that they were becoming broken, that they were turning back to God, that they understood that what they had done was, was going against what God had, had called. And even though they were upset, even though they didn't understand why they were still in the bondage that they found themselves in, they realized that God would deliver them. They realized that God would be the one that would see them through this. And, and in verse 10, it says, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. Not only was the nation of Israel going to see that they had been delivered, not only was the nation of Israel going to understand, but all the other nations, all those who had uh, had their eyes on taking them captive, all those who thought that that they might be able to overthrow them. Everybody that had their eyes turned on the, the mighty nation of Babylon, they were going to see that God delivered them from this bondage. There was a change that everybody could see. So what is it that God calls them to do once he redeems them, once he brings them out of bondage? Well, verse 11 and 12, he says, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear God. When God released Israel from the bondage of Babylon, it was a time that they were sort of reminiscing back to what happened in Egypt. He's saying that you need to be ready. You need to make yourself ready. Because when I call you out of bondage, there's going to be something that I require of you. And he says that when I let you go, I want you to forget everything that's happened here. I want you to put aside all the Babylonian habits you may have picked up. And if there is anything ungodly that you may have brought with you, get rid of them before you come back into Israel, before I return you to Jerusalem. Because he had a purpose for the return of the Jews to the holy city. They were to restore the temple. They were to rebuild the walls, and they were to bring back the city that God had given to them. Well, when we look at this, I, I think that, that this time when we see the nation of Israel as they leave Babylon, uh, it's not going to be in haste. It's not going to be be just something that happens overnight when the Pharaoh says, you're gone now, now you're, you're free, now leave. Uh, but this is going to be something that is orchestrated. This is going to be something that, that God has put into place. And instead of, of, of literally running out of Babylon, it says that, that the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear God. You see, your rear guard. So God is preparing the way for Jerusalem to be rebuilt by the release of the Jews going back into the holy city, and that he is going to lead them in confidence, and he is going to protect them as they go so that they will be uh, not in fear, but in, in rejoicing as they head back to the place where God had, had uh, called them to be, the, the holy city of Jerusalem. Now, verses 13 through 15, we see a little bit of a change also. We see a, a change in, in what is being described here. And this is where we, we start to see the first part of Jesus that is being revealed. We see a description of, of what is going to happen. And as he changes these words, he says, behold, 
he he wants their attention. He says, now stop what you're doing and turn your eyes on what is being said because it's it's important what it, I'm getting ready to tell you. So so I want all of your attention and I want you to turn your attention towards me and I want you to to listen to what I am saying. My servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Now, what Isaiah is saying here is he is describing Christ. He says, my, my servant. Well, we all know that this is Jesus. He, he came to earth as this lowly servant to serve each and every one that was on this earth at that time. And he was also uh, a servant for all of those Christians that were to come. And, and it gives a little bit of a description of, of the character of Christ. He says that he shall be wise that he shall be high and lifted up, that he shall be exalted. God is giving the description of, of who the person is that he sent. But as with all stories, there tends to be a but that is placed in there. And, and what God is saying is, I am the one that has placed him on this earth. I am the one that is placing him in a place of, of, of reverence, of awe, of, of, of royalty. But you're not going to accept him. As many were, ex were astonished at you. They couldn't believe that this lowly servant, a, a young child that was born in a manger, in an in a outdoor barn and laid in this feed trough. This humble child couldn't be the king that the Old Testament had said would, would, would be born. They were astonished. They couldn't wrap their mind around it. They, they couldn't understand. They, they didn't have the type of faith to be able to comprehend that this young baby was truly God's son. And we understand what happened after that time, that it says that he would be rejected by many and that he would be beaten beyond recognition. We see that playing out prior to the crucifixion. But there was a reason that that occurred. There was a reason that God came into this lowly form. And it's so that he could be this lamb that would be sacrificed, this perfect, this holy lamb, so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be saved. So shall he sprinkle many nations. If we go back and if we think about the priest, when they were set aside uh, in Aaron and his his sons back in Exodus chapter 29, when, when we see them being set apart into the priesthood, we see the ram, this, this lamb that was sacrificed, and the blood and the anointing oils were sprinkled on them to set them apart as being the spiritual leaders of Israel. Well, we all know that, that this blood sacrifice was something that God required for the atonement of sin in the Old Testament. But what we see is the depiction of Christ coming as the perfect lamb so that he would be sacrificed for all of us so that we could have this redemption, so that we could have this salvation so that we too could be atoned for our sins once and for all. And that it's given for everybody, for many nations. This last part, kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard 
they understand. I, I truly feel like that this is leading up into the return of Christ. I, I think that there are things that our leaders, these these nations uh, that's being depicted by the, the word kings here, that, that they're going to be silent over the things that they see happening because they don't have a, a clear understanding of what's happening. I, I see that today. I, I see our leaders in, in a state of confusion a lot of times. They, they see these things that are occurring in our world, and, and I don't think they understand exactly what has, has truly played out or what is truly playing out. But they understand that there is something that is happening. And, and I feel like that if they would look at the divine answer, that they would get an answer to the questions that some of them have. They haven't read it. They've not been told it, yet they see the things that are happening. They haven't heard it but they understand. I truly don't think that any of us, whether it be leaders, whether it be Christians, whether it be those who are unsaved, I don't think that any of us truly understand the glory of God. And we won't understand it until we see God's purpose and plan fulfilled, whether it be on earth or in heaven, when we see that second coming of Christ. I think it's then that we'll truly understand exactly what it is that God had in store for us, exactly what the purpose and the plan that Christ had for each and every one of us. And I think that it's then, and it is only then, when we see the completion of God's work, that we'll understand our salvation fully. God is telling the nation of Israel, I have set you apart for something different. I want so much more for you, but yet you continue to reject me. And when you reject me, there has to be a consequence that comes with that. But with that consequence comes a restoration. And, and I will see you built back up so that you can glorify me in the way that I want you to be glorified also. I think that speaks to us as Christians today also. God is saying that, that when you were you, you were in sin, I understood that you were, were contrary to me, that, that, that you weren't doing what I had called. But, oh, when, when you asked for salvation, I restored you back up. And, and now all I want you to do is, is do what I have called you to do. I want you to wake up. I want you to shake the dust off of you. I, I want you to rub the sleep from your eyes, and I want you to get ready because I'm calling you for a purpose and for a plan, even though you may not understand what I have in store for you. I'll protect you, I'll hold you, I'll guide you, and I will see you through. All right, any questions or comments tonight? All right. I appreciate everybody coming out and listening tonight. Lord willing, we will see you all uh, this Wednesday back in the sanctuary. We're going to start our Bible study back up at 630. Uh, so those that you know that may not have a link with Facebook, go ahead and let them know. And I'm going to try to get a letter out to everybody this week also to, to let them know the intentions of the church and what it is we'll be doing. God bless. We'll see you at the next appointed time.